going to be starting in just one minute, guys. Uh, I want to let the Tristram song finish because you can't just cut that off. So, yeah, one minute. What's going on, everybody? Today is Monday, April 23rd, 2012. This week is actually a huge week for me. Now, today is actually my birthday. Yeah, I turned 21 today. I know I'm a bit of a youngin, but for any of you guys that did any kind of math in the first episode, you would already know that. So what does this mean? This means that I can now legally drink one of these bad boys. Yes, this is Diablo beer. Pretty sweet. Um, I'm just going to throw this out there and say, the guy that made this is like a super huge nerd, and you're going to look at me and say, but Six, and why? It's Diablo beer. Diablo beer is freaking awesome. And I would say, yeah, you're right. Take a closer look, young Diablo one. Let me, let me just switch back to that for a second. What do we got going on here? We got sick Diablo beer, and we've got Darth Vader beer back here. <laughs> well, whatever, I don't know. I just thought that was pretty funny, and I need to point that out. Anyway. Today is my birthday. Um, tomorrow is actually my three-year anniversary with my girlfriend. That's pretty huge. Yeah, I'm, I'm getting up there. <laughs> um, this week I've got finals, and that really sucks, but whatever, you got to do it. So I have a final on Wednesday that I'm going to try and reschedule. So I should be able to do Wednesday show, 3 p.m. PST, you know, same time as normal. But I also have an episode, uh, sorry, an episode. I have a final on Friday and one on Saturday. So... That means my and it, you know my Friday's final is like at 3:15 or something like that. So I'm gonna have to figure out a different time to do my daily show, uh, whether it be before the final, which I, I don't think I want to do, just so I can you know have some time to study. So I'm thinking maybe I'll do the final later Friday night when I get home. I'm just throwing this out there, maybe 6 p.m. PST, which is 9 Eastern. Again, I'm not I'm not exactly sure. Um, I will I'll figure something out and um, I'll have something more concrete on Wednesday. Um, over the last couple of days, MLG Spring Arena happened, I think, and DRG won that one over, I think it was MC. I think it was MC. I could be wrong. might have been MVP. That's a little bit embarrassing, but whatever. Um, congratulations to DRG. DreamHack happened. Thorzane won that. That's pretty huge. Good job to him. Um, also, my beta keys. I've got some beta keys that I still need to give away that I was kind of hanging on to because of the open beta this weekend. Um, I'm going to be giving them away later today, and the rest of them I'm just going to give away tomorrow. Again, we've got like, what is it, uh, yeah, a week from tomorrow is the last day for the beta. So May 1st. So I'm going to try and give away all my keys today and tomorrow. That way you guys have a solid week left to play Diablo 3. Um, it's, it's really not that big of a deal. I mean, well, obviously the beta is a big deal, but uh, there's not all that much to play through, so a week is more than enough time. Uh, it's only about an hour's worth of content per character, so I mean if you actually explore every part of every single map and every location that you can possibly get to in the beta, it's probably around two hours. So two hours, let's say you do all five classes, is ten hours of gameplay. Yeah, I mean that's really nothing for a week's worth. So yeah, that's that's what I'm looking at. I'm going to try and give them away today and tomorrow. So don't forget to follow me on Twitter, at Sixen, and, and tweet me, hashtag Diablo Daily. Um, today's episode is going to be all about the lore, which is going to be a lot of fun. I had a little bit of trouble kind of coming up with uh, the plans for today, and, and it's not because I didn't know what was going on, it's just because there's just so much to talk about. The Diablo lore is by far, I'd have to say, one of the richest lores of the Blizzard universes. Um, it, it's very in-depth and in detail. I mean, I've got my Book of Cain here. Seriously, they made they made a, they made a Deckard Cain's journal with everything about Diablo, and it's pretty much just all the, ha you know, all the events of Diablo, all the games, the books, everything, from Decker Kane's perspective. This is awesome. It's like 20, 25 bucks. I would definitely suggest reading it. It's like 150 pages or so. 
it's really cool like you know the the pages are like all corroded and stuff like an old man's journal because it is an old man's journal um, we've got a letter in here at the beginning to Leia. Leia is his niece and adopted daughter. Um, so it's really cool. I definitely suggest checking it out. Um, there's also all the novels. Let me pull that up. I've got the list of, chron of them chronological order. So let's check this out. We've got the Sin War. We've got Demon's Bane and then the regular Diablo books, Moon of the Spider. Um, there's actually a Sin War trilogy, so you can just buy the or Sin War Archive. It's called the Sin War Archive. It comes with all three books. It's a lot cheaper to do it that way. So if you're interested in reading the books, I definitely suggest getting the archives. So the Sin War Archive is these three. Then we have the Diablo Archive, which is these four. And then you're just gonna have to get that bad boy separately. Um, I'm not sure why they did it that way, but that's just kind of how the cookie crumbles. So that's what's going on. So I mean, you're looking at three books really. Uh, which is actually eight books, <laughs> and then we've got a Diablo 3 specific book coming out on May 15th that's all about Diablo 3. So these these books that I just showed you, the Sin War and everything, that's everything that happens pre-Diablo 1. Um, and actually the regular Diablo archive, I believe, goes into Diablo 1 and into Diablo 2 as well. Yeah. <laughs> Talks about what happens in Diablo 2, and it, it kind of gives like a nice little prelude. I think one of them talks about the Warlord of Blood and the Summoner. The Summoner is one of the uh, one of the boss mini bosses you fight in Act Two of Diablo Two. So I would definitely recommend checking them out. If you, any of you guys are lore buffs, lore nerds, whatever, I definitely recommend reading them all. I've re read through all of them. They're all they're all awesome, and I definitely, definitely, hundred percent. If you don't get any of those, get the Book of Cain because this is friggin' sweet. Like I said, it's like twenty five bucks, hundred and fifty pages of everything that's happened in Diablo from Decker Cain's perspective. It'll set you up perfectly for the game. For Diablo 3, that is. I mean, if you don't want to read the rest of them, fine. But no matter what, get this bad boy, because this is awesome. Alright, so let's get into it. I'm going to kind of give a little prelude of what's going on. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about pre-Diablo 1. I'm going to talk about what happens throughout Diablo 1. And then I want to watch all the cinematics from Diablo 2, because I really feel like the Diablo 2 cinematics set up the storyline perfectly. Um, there's like a lot, a lot of stuff that happened pre-Diablo 1 that... It's not really, it's not going to take me forever to talk about, but there's just a lot of stuff to mention, so I'm probably just going to go through each of the things and talk for a minute or two per topic. Again, it's not that huge deal, and then we're going to get, once we get to Diablo 2, we're going to watch all the cinematics. It's about 20 minutes worth of cinematics, but split up into like seven of them. So I'm going to be able to, we're going to watch one, I'll talk a little bit about it, watch another, you know, talk about what I've seen and, and what's going on in, in the cinematic, because that just makes everything so much easier. Plus... It makes it so that way you don't have to just sit here and watch me talk for an hour for 45 minutes, however long this lasts. And then after Diablo 2, we're going to get, obviously, into what's happening between Diablo 2 and Diablo 3. And um, I'm, I might talk a little bit about Diablo 3. I, I don't want to get into too many spoilers, so maybe I'll just talk about what's in the beta. So to start off, we've got uh, pre-Diablo 1. This is, this is, it's called the Dawn. It's the very first thing that happens. It's the creation of everything, except for Sanctuary. Sanctuary is the place where Diablo actually takes place. So it's basically the creation of everything, except what we, like the place that we're in, which is kind of confusing, so bear with me. So we've got Anu, which is like this light warrior, and we've got Tathamet, which is a seven-headed dragon, and they're like combined. I, I don't, they're, <laughs> they're like merged into one. They're, they're almost like, uh, I don't even, the, the, the twins, Siamese twins, they're like combined into one, right? So Anu is this light warrior that stands for everything that is good in the world, and Tathamet stands for everything that's bad, obviously, seven-headed evil dragon. The two of them, they're just at an eternal conflict, which is actually the next thing that's about to come up. They're in an eternal conflict, obviously light and dark. They're just fighting for absolutely no reason. They're just fighting. And that's all they do, day and night, always and forever, they just fight. Okay? So, eventually, something happens and they both die. It doesn't really say what happens, it just says all of a sudden they die. And again, this is according to the Book of Cain. So, they both just die and that's how everything comes to be. Um, Anu's spine becomes the crystal arches, I believe, which are, like, the arches right outside of heaven. Um, Tathamet's, like, carcass is what becomes hell. It kind of shrivels up and becomes all dark and, and, and crisp or whatever, and becomes hell. And there are other things, like Anu's brain or, or pearl or whatever becomes, his eye, I believe, is what they said, becomes the, the world stone, and the world stone is basically what hides sanctuary from anybody seeing it. Uh, I'm going to get into that in a couple minutes when we get to there. Um, so that's that's the dawn. Everything, think back to like say the Big Bang theory or, or whatever you believe in. Um, everything just comes to be. 
So next we have the Eternal Conflict. The Eternal Conflict just gets picked up from right where Anu and Tathamet left off. Now instead of we have instead of Anu and Tathamet, the only two beings in the world, we have heaven and hell. So the angels of heaven and the demons of hell are just in this eternal conflict, light and dark, good and bad. Although not, not neither side is necessarily good or bad. They're just fighting because that's all they know. Neither one of them can get an advantage because that would be a terrible thing and the world would just like end which is actually kind of what the whole end of days thing is if you guys remember from the uh, Diablo 3 cinematic I showed off in the first episodes. The end of days, that's this prophecy that Deadly Kane is always talking about. That's, that's just th this thing that's kind of got him on edge in Diablo 3. So we've got this eternal conflict, heaven and hell are just always fighting and one day this guy, Inarius, and actually Lilith, well, let me, let me back up a little bit. Let me just talk about all the different characters. We've got, after Anu and Tathmet, we've got the Anguirus Council, which is Malphael, Ethereal, Tyrael, um, Ariel, and I can never remember the last one. But basically, it's it's the the angels, like the, uh, it's, it's the council, the group of, of angels that kind of just run the show in heaven. They, there's not one overarching leader, it's just all of them. They kind of take part. And there's this other guy called Inarius. So there's the five, and then there's Inarius, who's just kind of their advisor. For Hell, we have Diablo, we have Baal, and Mephisto. Those are the prime evils. And then we have Andariel, we have Duriel, Belial, and Asmodon. And those other four are called lesser evils. So we get to the creation of Sanctuary. Remember... This eternal conflict is going on just for all time, and heaven and hell are still fighting. Well, one day, Inarius, the advisor to the Anguirus Council, just decides, I'm tired of fighting. You know, I've got better things to do with my time than just fight this ridiculously long-lasting battle because it's never going to end. So, he's kind of the smart one, I almost want to say. Although his actions kind of change the course of history in Diablo forever. So, we've got Inarius who kind of just secludes himself, and then we have Lilith. Lilith is the daughter of, I believe, Andariel and Mephisto. And she decides the same thing for whatever reason. Like, hey, you know, I don't really want to fight anymore, so I'm going to skedaddle. So Inarius and Lilith get together, and they decide, hey, let's make this place called Sanctuary. Again, that's why it's called Sanctuary, because it's this place. It's supposed to be this paradise where no fighting is going on. So Inarius and Lilith, and they take whatever demons and angels they want, come with them, and they decide that they're going to stop fighting and they're just going to make this place where they can go to without having to worry about it. Just complete peace, which is kind of weird. Angels and demons living in peace. Like I said, neither side is necessarily good or bad. They're just fighting just because that's what they know. One represents light, one represents dark. You really, neither side can have an advantage. It needs to have that balance. And that's that's where we come in as the Nephilim. So Narnius and Lilith, they make this place called Sanctuary. And they decide, hey, we need to stay here and now we're going to procreate. So they have kids, and the first kids are called the Nephilim. Now the Nephilim, um, the, uh, there's there's two that I want to talk about. There's probably a couple more important ones. I think the Book of Cain mentioned uh, two more, like Vasily or something like that, which is Bolkathos' younger brother. Um, Isu is one of them, but they're really not that important. So again, we have Bolkathos, who becomes like the first barbarian, and we have Ravma, who becomes the first necromancer. Those are Again, those are two classes in Diablo 2. So those are the two most important ones that I'm just going to touch on a little bit. And then we also kind of have this weird dragon figure who's not light, who's not dark. It's just kind of his job to be like... It, he, it's kind of weird, right? Because I remember reading the Sin, the Sin War trilogy, and he's just... He's not even really a dragon. He's like a dragon in a constellation. So imagine looking up into the night sky. Um, and, and you, you know, you see the constellations. You see the Big Dipper, the Little Dipper, whatever, Orion's Belt. Well, imagine just seeing a dragon, and the stars are always moving and, and realigning, and basically that's supposed to be everybody's fate and destiny. So Tragul, this this, this dragon constellation, has its own realm. So there's heaven, there's hell, whatever else Anu and Tathomet created that we don't really know about. We just know that there are other realms out there. We have Sanctuary. We have this thing called the Black Abyss, which is actually in hell. It's where demons are spawned and where they go when they die. So when, demon, when a demon dies, it isn't actually die permanently, he goes to this place called the Black Abyss. There's also this thing called the Void, which I'm going to touch on in a couple minutes as well. The Void is basically just where you go when you get trapped in a soul stone. That's pretty much the gist of it. So we've got 
the Nephilim, Rathma and Bulkathos. Bulkathos kind of takes its place, I believe, on Mount Ariat, which is where the Ancients come into play, and, and the Ancients are supposedly these old Nephilim, they're in Diablo 2. That's the story behind them. Rathma is the really interesting one, because he was one of the main characters in the Sumor trilogy as well. He became the first necromancer, he kind of followed Tragul, and the two of them made it their job, well actually Tragul was first, obviously, because he's kind of just this dragon star, who was there like before the beginning of time, or something along those lines. Sorry, my throat's kind of dry. So we've got Ravma, who becomes his first necromancer, who makes it his job to help Tragul keep the balance between light and dark. He is obviously not an angel, nor a demon, he's the offspring of both, and now we've got this next thing called the Purge, Basically, Lilith wants to take the Nephilim. She sees them as a great, great asset. She wants to take them, make an army, and just take over everything herself. Inaris, on the other hand, is, is very afraid of what the Nephilim might do, so he wants to kill them all. That's where Inarius and Lilith kind of bat heads. Inarius basically, basically takes Lilith and traps her in the Black Abyss. No, sorry, in the Void. Confusing myself now. Inarius takes Lilith and traps her in the Void. Thus, we have the Purge. Now we have Naria's kind of free reign over the Nephilim in Sanctuary. And actually, the World Stone is created when Sanctuary happens as well. Uh, I'm going to talk about that later during Diablo 2, because, I mean, yeah. This is a lot of this stuff gets touched on in Diablo 2. Diablo, like I said, Diablo 2 is huge for the storyline of the game. Um, so we've got the Purge. Now, Naria's traps Lilith in this, in, in this place called the Void. It's just this other realm, just all dark, and there's really nothing for her to do. She's just permanently here. Somehow, she escapes. Which is very odd. Now, obviously, this is kind of just like a brief, brief rundown of everything that happens pre Diablo 1. Um, there's, you know, chapters and chapters about it in this. I'm just kind of giving you the important events because it's really interesting if you're a lore nerd, but if you're not, then you're going to be bored sitting here listening to me talk. So, we've got the purge just happened. Lilith is, Lilith is trapped, and now she breaks out somehow. Nobody knows how. She just gets out. And this is where the Sin War Trilogy happens. Well, I, I keep calling it Sin War Trilogy. It, it's, it's called the Sin War, and I'm talking about the book series, the Sin War Trilogy. Um, or the Sin War Archive, if you decide to get that, whatever. Sin War happens, and here's what we have. I want to call him, like, the first paladin. Well, Dissian. I don't... He's not, he doesn't necessarily show off one particular character trait or another, but I kind of saw him as, like, a paladin-type character, a monk-type character, something in between. Um, we also have his brother, Mendelin, who be also becomes a necromancer, the second necromancer. He follows Rathma. Uh, and then we have Achilleos, who is a, an archer-type class, so a rogue. He's a, he's a guy, but he's like a rogue Amazon-type thing. And we also have um, Serenthia, which... I, I guess I won't say it, because it's kind of spoilers, but we have Serenthia, who is just the girl that uh, Odysseus falls in love with and whatnot. You'll find out if you actually read the books. I don't want to spoil it. So Lilith somehow comes back, and she tries to take over everybody, basically. Odysseus gathers the Nephilim together, and they just have this huge thing, and they fight uh, the demons, they get help from the angels, and then towards the end, and I, I, actually, I, I don't want to fast forward too much, during Sin Wars when a lot of the religions of Diablo come to be, and I'm going to talk a lot about more uh, of the culture of Diablo in next week's episode. So... We have the religions like the Zacharum and the Triune and the I don't remember the third one, but basically there's one for the the heaven and there's one the Cathedral of the Light maybe is what it was. So there's one for the heaven, one for heaven, and one for hell, and then there's a third one. So we've got oh I'm still here. Sorry, <laughs> that's what happens when you don't touch your mouse. Computer goes to sleep. Um, so basically now we've got these religions coming up uh, in, in Diablo. So they are able to foster their own followings and, and what have you. So, they each side, Heaven and Hell, decides, hey, you know, we need to take part in this. And all this time, again, Heaven and Hell are still fighting. Eventually they sign a treaty, but that hasn't happened yet. So, Sin Wars Trilogy, that happens. Towards the end of it, we have this thing called the Reset. The Reset is basically... The Nephilim have defeated the demons and, and Lilith. And the angels come come along, and Tyrael kind of makes his way in there. The angels come along, and they say, well, we don't like these Nephilim. The demons could potentially use them for bad. We need to just eradicate them all. And they, they put it to this vote, and they decide that somehow, it's, it's like a super close vote. It's like 3 to 2 or 4 to 3, something, something like that. 
and they decide that the humans are allowed to stay, or the Nephilim, sorry, are allowed to stay, but they are going to wipe their memories of everything, so that way nobody remembers that this happened. Again, this is why it's called the reset. They reset everybody's memories and things go back to normal. That goes on. Next, we have the Mage Clan Wars. The Mage Clan Wars are just these Mage Clans. One of the big ones are the Vizurai, and then there's the Inead, I believe. Um, there's there's a bunch of different clans. It's, it's not really worth it knowing all their names. Vizurai is the big one, though. That's something you want to remember. Um, Vizurai Sorcerer is actually... Well, sorry, I'm shaking. Because my feet are on my desk. Um, sorry, the, so the Vizurai is actually one of the, the Diablo 1 Sorcerer. He's part of the Vizurai Clan. So we've got these Mage Clan Wars. They're fighting. Uh, the mages decide that they want to learn how to summon demons and first it starts off all cool and then they find out that these demons are going to just t completely take over and actually I think that's where the the Diablo archive picks up um, the warlord of blood used to be a sorcerer not particularly a visurai but he was a sorcerer his brother the summoner um, was I uh, was in fact I believe a visurai sorcerer and they kind of bat heads, and the, the Warlord of Blood, that's why it's called the Warlord of Blood, summons all these demons, and they just kind of go and kill all kinds of mages. And, like, that's this terrible thing, and they've got these wars going on. That's kind of the gist of it. It's a couple pages long, but that's really the gist of it. Um, so, again, mages just fighting within themselves, and then they decide that they're not going to have any demons anymore. The Warlord of Blood wants to have demons again anyway, so they fight, and they eventually kill him. Next big thing that happens is the Dark Exile. Wow, why am I shaking still? I'm just going to not move again. Okay. The Dark Exile happens. And basically this is um, the people in Hell, like Belial and Asmodon and Baal and, and Diablo and Mephisto, all the prime and lesser, lesser, ugh, lesser evils, they're fighting amongst themselves also in Hell. And the lesser evils kick out the prime evils, so... The four lesser ones kick out Diablo, Mephisto, and Baal into Sanctuary. So they exile them, hence the Dark Exile. They're, those primevils are now exiled from Hell. They have really nowhere else to go, so now they kind of just end up in Sanctuary. Now, from what I understand, these prime and primevils aren't able to actually come in their true form, so they need a shell. So this is where the Hunt for the Three kind of happens. Now... Remember, now these primevils are in Sanctuary looking for something to take over. They need a body, they need a, a physical shell. Something, right? So now this is where we have the hunt for the three. Obviously, Mephisto, Diablo, and Baal. Here's where the Herodrum is just a group of Nephilim descendants. So they're not necessarily Nephilim, but, I mean, they're kind of humans. They're still Nephilim, but they're just, you know, way down there, they're descendants. Why do I keep shaking? Jeez. Anyway. I'm just going to try and move as little as possible. So, the Herodrim, uh, they decide that they're going to hunt for these three with Tyrael. Tyrael is the angel of Ju Archangel of Justice. He comes along and says, Hey guys, we need to come and get these prime evils out of Sanctuary before they kill everything. Which is obviously not a good thing. So the Herodrim is just this group of individuals that offer themselves to help Tyrael find these evils. Um, Enter Jared Kane. Jared Kane is Deckard Kane's like great 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 grandfather type thing, um, and also this other guy, oh Tal Rasha, and this third guy Zoltan Cool. Zoltan Cool we're gonna encounter in Diablo three. I'm not gonna give out too many spoilers, but he's like this maddened guy basically, this maddened Herodrum that they were supposed to kill. So during the hunt for the three, they they make these soul stones out of the world stone. and they take these world stone shards and they make these soul stones. Now these soul stones are just magical things for... They're, they're just magical rocks. Oh, I think it's because of my fan. Ah, okay, I'm going to turn that off. Give me one sec. Because I'm sitting here and my webcam's not even moving, and, I mean, I'm not moving and my webcam is just shaking. Can't imagine what the heck's going on. Okay, so that's... No, we're still shaking. Alright, I'm just going to not move. I'm sorry, guys. Anyway, um... Where was I? Right, Herodrum. So they're on the hunt for the three. Um, they have these soul stones. They have the amber soul stone, which is the red one, <laughs> um, for Diablo. And then we have a blue one for Mephisto, and I think it was a yellow one for Bale. Um, so basically these soul stones are just supposed to be... We're supposed to be able to trap these primevals in the soul stones. This is what the Herodrum set out to do. So they, they fight... 
bail first. They fight. I don't even remember. I'm sorry. They fight Mephisto or Bale. One of them they fight first. Doesn't even matter the order. Um, I think it's Bale, actually. Yeah. So they fight Bale. Tal Rasha. Uh, actually, they fight Bale. Tal Rasha has, like, this final blow on him. And somehow. Now, <laughs> this is actually kind of interesting. This is in the Book of Cain. Somehow, Bale's soul stone shatters. So they have these tiny pieces of shards, and they just want to take the biggest, the biggest shard to use it for Bale. Now, some say that it was just because. You know, Bale's last effort, he knows what's going to happen. He doesn't want to be trapped. So in his last dying effort, he throw, you know, he hurls this bolt of lightning or fire, whatever, and he hits the soul stone and it shatters. Others, according to Deckard Cain, say that Zoltan Cool did it on purpose. He just dropped it, you know, oops, <laughs> whoops, and it just shatters. So now that they've defeated Bale, they need something to do with his, you know, they need to get rid of his essence and his spirit somehow. Zoltan Cool takes it upon himself his self to come up with this great idea, and and everybody kind of looks at him. And he's like this this sketchy sorcerer guy. That's he was like the leader of of oh no this is talk yeah Zoltan Cool is like the sketchy sorcerer guy. He says these shards aren't going to be enough. Somebody needs to give themselves up and and take on the, the the task of containing this essence. So instead of volunteering himself, Tal Rasha was this huge like sorcerer guy he was the leader of i believe of the Inead clan he was like this big alchemist a magician sorcerer type thing and he says you know what guys i'm going to take one for the team and i'm going to strap myself here in this desert and you guys are going to shove it in my chest the soul stone and tie me to this giant weird looking thing and that's going to be that. I'm going to hold the essence for the rest of my life. It's going to be a terrible sacrifice but I'm going to do it because I want you guys to be able to survive and everything. Wow, Tal Rasha, you're the man. Okay, Tal Rasha now gives himself up. Sultan Cool doesn't have to worry about that. He dodges a bullet. So now we have Mephisto. Mephisto... We kill Mephisto, trap him in the uh, Blue Soul Stone and we basically give him to the Zacharum Church. We don't want to have to deal with Losing another one of our members, so we give them to the Zacharum Church. Zacharum Church has the leader, who is the K. Hagen, I believe, and that's it, the K. Hagen is his job. He doesn't have to like you know stick it in his head or anything. He they kind of just have it in this like altar, and they just watch it and make sure nothing happens to it. Perfect. So that's two of the three taken care of. Now we've got the third one, Diablo. Diablo somehow takes control over Archbishop Lazarus, and. Now he doesn't actually become like he doesn't he doesn't take that shell. He just kind of like gets into his head and he starts making him go crazy. So Archbishop Lazarus now tells King Leoric, the king of Conduras, I believe, to take their guys over to Tristram and use Tristram as the uh, you know as as like the capital city. So King Leoric, and this is this is actually where Diablo One starts off. It's called the uh, Darkening of Tristram. <laughs> so yeah, I've kind of got a little bit of notes here, so I'm cheating. Um, so it's called the Darkening of Tristram. This is where Diablo One starts off. We've got Zoltan, Zoltan Cool now supposedly dead. Um, the Haradrim knew that he was kind of going crazy and he like disappeared. And some of the Haradrim also settled in Tristram, but some of the elves kind of just went off in their separate ways to explore and research and do all the kinds of things that scientists and anthropologists type people do. That's kind of their thing. So Zoltan Cool kind of goes mad after he goes on this journey with them, you know, for the hunt for the three, and they kill him somehow. It doesn't say how, it just says, Decker Kane even says, I'm not going to get into how we killed him, all that matters is that we did. However, he somehow comes back in Diablo 3, and I will touch on my thoughts about that once I get to that point in time. So we've got Diablo 1. Archbishop Lazarus is now taken under control, you know, mind control by Diablo. Lazarus convinces King Leoric to move to Tristram. Tristram is the is the city in Diablo 1 and, and kind of use that as his capital city. And and King Leoric, and actually these are part of the journals from Diablo 3 that we listened to had you played, if you guys have played the beta. It's like King Leoric's journals and Leoric's like, what's up with Lazarus? Or, yeah, what's up with Lazarus? Why is he taking me to this, this godforsaken place? It's like this small, tiny town. It's not fit for a king. Actually, that's, those are his exact words. It's not fit for a king. He can't imagine why he's there. But again, Lazarus is taken control by Diablo. Diablo slowly but surely gets to King Leoric, and he and King Leoric starts to go mad. Now, King Leoric has two children, Aiden, which is the warrior from Diablo One, 
and Albrecht. They're both princes, obviously, because he's a king. And he, he starts going mad. He becomes the, the, the Black King, is what they call him. And Lazarus takes Albrecht uh, into the cathedral, the Tristram Cathedral, which is where Diablo 1 basically occurs. You're in Tristram, and the cathedral is where you go to fight everybody. So Albrecht, or Lazarus kidnaps Albrecht and takes him down, and then starts going, and then goes to Tristram and says, Oh my god, somebody stole Albrecht. Right? Like, what? So, somebody took him out. It wasn't me. I have no idea who did it. So Leoric, oh, i got to start moving my mouse. So Leoric is now super paranoid. He thinks people are after him. You know, they just stole his child. Crazy stuff starts going on. He doesn't know what to do with himself. So he, in his paranoia, sends the army to war against Westmarch. And Kanduras is a hell of a lot smaller than Westmarch. Westmarch is like... I don't even have a, like, a good thing. It would be like the United States fighting some tiny, small, like, ridiculously not important country. Not that the United States is awesome, because I know there are a lot of non-U.S. people, but, like, that's a good analogy. Like, imagine a huge U.S. army, which would be West March, taking on, like, this small, say, like, I don't know. I don't even want to throw it out there, because, you know, I have no idea what about world armies and whatnot. But, you know, it's just something tiny. Um, so that's kind of the gist of that, and that tiny one is, tr is Conduras and Tristram. So Aiden, the eldest son, King Lorik's eldest son, decides, well, I want to please my father, so I'm going to join the army, and I'm going to go fight. And Albrecht, on the other hand, is, you know, is missing. So Aiden goes to the war, goes to war and fights. Leoric goes down to the cathedral looking for his son and never comes back. Now, we've got Leoric's best warrior, Lachdanen. He takes a small little group with him, and they go down to the cathedral to find find out what happened to their beloved king. And they find out that Leoric has gone mad and he's now the skeleton king. And, well, he's not skeleton king yet. Sorry. Leoric has gone mad and Leoric thinks, in his paranoia again, that now Lachdanen is the one that stole Albrecht. So he orders his army and or the warriors that he took with him to kill Lachdanen. So Lachdanen and the couple guys that he took with him they kind of have this duel, and like Dana ends up dying, but he kills the Auric. Like that's his last thing. Like he makes it, he, and that's another one of the journalists. He's like, nobody had better, had more love for my king than I did, even when I drove my braid, my my blade through his dying body, or something along those lines. And that, like, that's pretty sick. <laughs> it's like it, it, it's like King Arthur. No, nah, that's that's a bad analogy. Never mind. Anyway, like Dana kills the Auric. So now we've got the skeleton king. He somehow comes back. Diablo raises him from the dead. And we've got Leoric. King Leoric is now the guy that we know in Diablo 1. He's the Skeleton King. He's one of the mini-bosses. We fight him. That's that. He's a big major quest guy. Okay. So Leoric is now a Skeleton King. Aiden is now off, is still off in the war that Leoric sent them on. And Albrecht is gone. So as these three classes, uh, eventually six, but for now three, is, is all that's canon. The Warrior, which is Aiden. And then we have the Rogue and the Sorcerer. They venture back to Tristram. Aiden finds out, holy crap, my dad is missing, my brother's missing, I'm going to go find them. So Aiden takes the rogue and the sorcerer with him. Um, the rogue is one of the uh, archers from the Sisters of the Sightless Eye, which is Act 1 NPCs. And then we have the sorcerer, which is a Vizdry warrior, or Vizdry sorcerer, sorry. So we've got the three of them. They venture down into the cathedral, kill King Leoric, who Aiden then finds out just killed his own dad. They get to Lazarus, they kill Lazarus because they found out that he was uh, taking control of Diablo, but now Diablo is alive somehow. So they get down to hell, they venture through hell. These three people, brave warriors, they venture through hell, they finally kill Diablo, and as soon as Diablo dies, he shrinks and turns into Albrecht. So now Aiden's going crazy, I just killed my little brother, my I killed my dad. What do I do? The soul stone is sitting here. So he takes the soul stone, plunges it into his own head. Diablo one. That's where Diablo one ends. Decker Kane gives this little spiel saying he he took this major sacrifice. He's trying to contain the essence himself, but he's starting to go mad. So now in between Diablo one and two, he starts talking to Adria the witch. Uh, uh, sorry, Aiden is the warrior. He starts talking to Adria the witch. The rogue goes back to Act 1 in Diablo 2, which is the Sisters of the Sightless Eye, the rogue encampment. The sorcerer goes to Act 2, um, Luke Gawain. 
that's good for them. The warrior kind of sticks around Tristram, doesn't talk to anybody, goes to the bar and drinks, doesn't talk to anybody again, and he starts going crazy. He's the only person he, he doesn't even talk to Cain. Cain is supposed to be this this huge intellectual individual who knows everything. Cain's like, dude, you gotta tell me what's going on. I need to know. I've got stuff to write down, notes to jot. I need to find out. Like, this is important history. I need to know. He won't even talk to Cain. He just goes and talks to Adria in the middle of the night. Aiden and Adria end up having a baby, and that's where the Dark Wanderer comes into play. Aiden, the warrior from Diablo 1, becomes the Dark Wanderer, who now, this is where Diablo 2 picks up. He's now searching for Bale and Mephisto's soul stones, because he wants to let them out, right? Because he, the Diablo is corrupting the, his mind and everything, and actually, this is where Diablo 2 is going to pick up, so I'm going to take just a short commercial break, because I need to get some more water, my throat's killing me. And then we're going to start, we're going to watch the Diablo 2 cinematics. Like I said, it's about 20 minutes of cinematics. I'm going to talk in between each of them, and that should be good, clean fun. All right, I'll be back in just a moment or two. Okay, I got some water. I'm back. And actually, if you guys that are in chat right now, was was my fan in the background bad? I mean, it's like super hot here in Arizona. It's like 100 degrees, so it's ridiculous. I'm just trying to stay, you know, not sweating and pouring sweat. Like, I got my door closed, my lights on and everything. Was the fan terrible? I mean, obviously, I know I turned it off, but was it all that bad? Anybody? Well, for whatever reason, my chat's not working. So, whatever. Okay. Important thing is the fan's off now. So, anyway, let's get into Diablo 2. I'm going to show off the first cinematic, and we are going to check that out and talk a little bit about it. Okay. Um, here we go. The, the first one's a little bit lengthy, so and it's like seven minutes long, but the rest of them are only two minutes, so shouldn't be that bad. I think it'll be actually a lot of fun watching it. Here we go.
So, Marius, at last I find you. I'm oh, sorry, I gotta pause it right there just for one sec because it, it, it's supposed to be like this super serious, goth, like crazy, just just completely serious. <laughs> like look back on this, on what this guy is going through. Marius, this crazy guy, <laughs> and then you've got this little dwarf midget kind of guy. He's like, do you want something? <laughs> I just think that's hilarious. Okay, okay, all right, it gets me every time. All right, back back to it. Here we go.
why did I follow him? I don't know. Why do things happen as they do in dreams? All I know is that when he beckoned, I had to follow him. And from that moment, we traveled together east. Always into the east. Wow. So, like I said, that was a little bit lengthy, seven minutes long, but I think that was definitely worth showing, and we're going to look at actually the rest of them as well. Only The rest of them are only two, three minutes long. But, if you guys haven't played Diablo 2 any time within the last decade, like, you're probably like me. You watched Cinemax the very first playthrough, and then you probably never watched them again. For those of you that haven't played Diablo 2, this is definitely worth uh, watching because it's an awesome brush up and basically covers everything that happens in Diablo 2. Um, so anyway, let's just talk about what we just saw. We have Marius, this this crazy guy who's sitting in this cell at the very beginning, and and that's supposed to be that's like in the future. And then they look back. So we have Marius sitting there, crazy, maddened, and his you know he's just in the fetal position. And this this hooded figure that appears to be Tyrael. Again, Tyrael is the archangel of justice. He comes in and he starts talking to Marius, and Marius is like, "But it wasn't my fault. There's nothing I could do. The Wanderer made me do all these crazy things." And that's when we start the flashback. We go to this bar. He's just sitting there, hasn't slept in God knows when. He's in these tattered rags. He's just he's trying to get drinks from this midget guy with the funny voice. <laughs> and he's just he's just going insane. And now the Dark Wanderer comes in, dragging his sword. And the Dark Wanderer, aka the Diablo One Warrior, who is named known as Aiden now, he himself plunged the Soul Stone in his head. He's now being corrupted by Diablo, going crazy. He's losing control. As you saw in the video, his soul started leaving his body until he fought it back in and pulled it back in. That's kind of what was going on. And you saw his top of head, his head started turning red and going crazy. That's tra Diablo trying to break out, basically. So that's kind of the gist of it. I know it was a relatively long um, introduction for Diablo 2, but it, it really sets the stage for it. And I really like what Marius says at the end. He says, East. Whenever the Dark Wanderer beckoned, I answered, and we always went east, always into the east. And basically the east is where the, his brothers are, his brothers being Mephisto and Baal. We've got Mephisto in the Traven Call, uh, which is in Act 3 of Diablo. Or, sorry, Mephisto is in Endurance of Hate, which is under Traven Call, anyway. Um, and then we also have uh, Baal, which is supposed to be in Act 2, which is in Loot Galen. He's, like, trapped in the Canyon of the Magi in, in this... Tomb, Tall Rosh's tomb is what it's called. Because Tall Rosh is the guy that they buried, stone or trapped to this thing. So anyway, that was a really long introduction for just Act One. But essentially, what happens is that's the opening cinematic for the game. We get into Act One. In Act One, we go and we kill the the very first quest is to kill Blood Raven. Blood Raven is the rogue from Diablo One. She becomes corrupted, and we kill her. So now we have the Diablo One warrior, aka Aiden who's now the Dark Wanderer, going f and, and trying to set his brothers free. We have the Diablo 1 Rogue, who becomes corrupted herself, and is the it is Blood Raven, who we kill. So, fast forward a little bit, we do some other meaningless a or tasks. We actually rescue Deckard Cain from Tristram. Tristram, like, gets burned down, the demons go through, as you can see, the Dark Wanderer. Basically, everywhere he goes, hell comes to pass. Hell, you know, Diablo, uh -huh, see what I did there? So... Wherever the Dark Wanderer goes, hell is to follow. Actually, I think they said that in the video. Um, so Tristram, he leaves Tristram and hell follows. Tristram gets all burned down and people get slaughtered. Griswold gets it gets corrupted and and Tristram basically gets run down. Cain gets trapped by all these fallen and put in a cage. Those were like ridiculously desperate times for Edgar Cain. He was terrible. He was terrified. You know, he talks about that in the Book of Cain I've got going on here. Awesome read. I know I keep saying it, but it's freaking sweet. Um, Decker King gets trapped. We go back and we rescue Decker King from Act One Tristram. He says, Thank you. I owe you, you know, my life. He identifies items for us for free. That's gameplay mechanics for you. Um, so we go in. The, the, big, the big thing in Diablo, or sorry, Diablo 2 Act 1 is Andariel. Andariel, again, the maiden of anguish. We kill her. She's one of the lesser evils. So we kill her at the end of Act 1. So, again, we've got Diablo 1 characters, two of them, 
We got the Dark Wanderer as the warrior. He's trying to set the guys free. The rogue is now dead. And Dario, remember, one of the seven prime evil or seven evils. We've got three prime and four lesser, and Dario's one of the lesser evils. She dies in Act 1. Keep that in mind. So now let's jump to Act 2. So this is like the prelude to Act 2. So basically, we, we saw the intro to Diablo 2 in the Act 1. We do Act 1, and now here, this is the video that we are greeted with in-game. We traveled east, over the mountains, and into the vast deserts of broken lands. As the days passed, my companion told me of himself, that he had once been a great warrior, and that a dark and secret burden now weighed heavily upon him. We traveled for an eternity across that barren wasteland. How long? I couldn't say. And always, a dark cloud seemed to follow us just over the horizon. Finally, the journey ended. We climbed the last bridge. There below us lay our destination. The shining jewel root lane with a great sea beyond. We made camp that last night. Perhaps it was the warm desert wind or the sound of the ocean, but for the first time in many weeks, I slept. However, the dreams returned, but these were clearly not my own. I beheld the vision of a great man, the mage, Talrasha. You were there too, Tyrael. I remember seeing you in my dream. His brethren had cornered a great demon, Baal, the Lord of Destruction, who had been set loose upon the world. They attempted to imprison the demon within a sacred stone. Yet when their attempts failed, Talrasha selflessly volunteered to contain the demon within himself, completing the prison. He instructed his brethren to bind him within a tomb, buried under the sand, there to wrestle with the demon for all eternity. Now you know what I seek, Marius. This is my brother. Sleep now. We set out with the dawn. The next morning, we walked over the hill toward Lutgulain. I had no idea then of the horrors that were in store for me there. So, now what we saw was what I was basically talking about um, before I started trying these videos. Remember, pre-Diablo 1, all this stuff happened. Uh, Marius is now seeing these visions of what happened before. He saw Tyrael and the Haradrim go in with the with the Yellow Soul Stone and imprison Bale. That was Tal Rasha chain there, um, with in the in the like the mummified wrap and whatever. And that was kind of the gist of what I was talking about before. So they, they chained Tal Rasha there to, the, to that godforsaken place in the middle of the desert by Luke Galane. He's, Marius put it better himself, he was now chained there to wrestle with Baal for the rest of eternity. That was kind of his job. Like I said before, Tal Rasha took one over the team. Okay? Now Marius is seeing these visions in his, in his sleep. And actually he said it, he hadn't slept in ages, and finally he found sleep out in the middle of the desert, believe it or not. And... He jumps and wakes up and notices he's having like this nightmare, and the Dark Wanderer says, "Well, now you understand. This is my brother." So that's kind of why they're going east. They expect to find to find and actually release Bale in Act Two, underground in that desert tomb. Well, 
lo and behold, we get to we get to look at Lane as as these character classes that we play. You know, the barbarian, the sorceress, the druid, Amazon assassin, yada yada yada. All the seven Diablo two classes we get here. We kill this guy called Radiment. He's just some mini boss. Um, the rest of the stuff isn't that important. Basically, we find these Herodric artifacts, the cube, the staff, and the amulet, and we put it together, and that's how we are supposed to be able to get into um, Talrosh's tomb with these with these artifacts. So in order to get to the tomb, we have to go into the Arcane Sanctuary. The Arcane Sanctuary is like another dimension of normal sanctuary. We get there, and it's supposed to be this big maze, and everything looks alike. We're not supposed to be able to find the end. Eventually, after you explore enough, you find the end, you kill this guy called the Summoner, and he's just this Vizdrai Sorcerer. Hey, wait a minute. Vizdrai Sorcerer? Yes, this is the Diablo 1 Sorcerer who ends up becoming corrupted, and we kill him. So now, three of the six Diablo 1 character classes are kind of like dead. So the, the sorcerers we just killed in Act Two, the rogue we killed in Act One, the warrior against Dark Wanderer, and then we kind of have these other three that were added in Hellfire, which isn't necessarily official canon, but I still like to recognize them. It's the barbarian, and we're just going to call him the Diablo Two barbarian, so he's taken care of. And then we also have the bard and the monk. Monk we don't hear anything about, and the bard I'll touch on later. So for all intents and purposes, Diablo One's taken care of at this point. All the classes we know taken care of. Actually, some of the NPCs are even taken care of. Like, Wirt, we find his dead body in Diablo 2 in Tristram. Um, Griswold, I said, became corrupted and we kill him. Decker Kane, we rescue. Uh, that's about it, I guess, for now. For now. I think we can even see, like, Farnham's dead body. Farnham was, like, the town drunk. Anyway, we just... We see this prelude to Act 2. We get in. We now kill the Diablo, or the Diablo 1 Sorcerer, the Summoner. We gather these Herodric artifacts, we get to Talrosh's tomb, we shove this staff down into the ground, it opens up this place, we go into the tomb, you know, breaks a hole in, we get in, and now there's this one of the prime evils, Duriel. We kill Duriel, we get there to see Tyriel standing there, where we expect to tell Russia, and Tyriel basically tells us, well, he's not here, he's gone. So Bale gets out, and that's that. So now Bale and Diablo are out. Now, the next thing is... They're going to find Mephisto, who's supposed to be in Act 3. Well, he actually is in Act 3. So, now they're going to find Mephisto, who's in Act 3. So, we've got Marius still following Diablo, or the Dark Wanderer, and now Bale, this giant friggin' primeval who's just walking around the Earth. So, Marius is still going nuts. He still follows him. So, let's check this out. It's called Mephisto's Jungle. My companion drew in the dank, cold air of the tomb. It seemed to strengthen him. I stood in the doorway between light and dark. What was left of my sanity implored me not to enter. But that voice was just a whisper now. As we worked our way down, deeper and deeper into the crypt, I began to see a change in my companion. He seemed to be gaining strength. I could hardly see in the gloom, but my companion seemed to know the way. We came at last to a great hall. It was then I realized my companion hadn't been gaining strength. He had been losing what was left of his humanity.
He moved with demonic speed, and then... And you appeared. Stop! The beast contained herein shall not be set free, not even by you. just ensured the doom of this world. You cannot even begin to imagine what you've set in motion this day. Go to the Temple of Light in the eastern city of Karast. There you will find the gate to hell opened before you. You must find the courage to step through that gate, Marius. Take the stone you hold to the Hellforge, where it will be destroyed. Now run. Take the stone and run! did I have? I ran. Whoop, sorry about that guys. So yeah, um, I mean, okay, I wasn't wrong, I just kind of went a little bit too far ahead. What you just saw was, yes it was the Act 3 cinematic, but I forgot, basically it's, again, it's recollections, so we're not actually going through this in, in, in time, we're kind of Again, it's Marius looking back and showing off what just happened. So, what just happened was what I was explaining before. We haven't gotten to Mephisto yet. He just, he, he took out the yellow so stone from Bale. That was Tal Rosh's tomb again. And Tyriel cuts them off. He starts fighting the Dark Wanderer, who is Diablo. So the two of them go at it. And Marius sees Tal Rasha, and he's like, you know, maddened. And he's like, oh my god, i got to help this guy. Pulls the soul stone out, and that's when Tyriel goes crazy. He picks him up, you know, and the, the whole ram is by his neck. And he says, you know, what, what have you just done? Oh my god, I can't believe it. Go to the Temple of the Light, which is the place in Act 3 where Mephisto is being held. Smash the soul stone, let them take care of it, whatever. you got to do it. Otherwise, the world is going to just end. So, we've got Marius running around with Bale's soul stone and the Dark Wanderer who is now, we're not sure, based on that cinematic. I don't want to, like, spoil stuff. So based on that cinematic, we're not sure. He just fought Tyrael. Tyrael went crazy. He, like, hit him and stuff. So we've got Marius. that needs to travel to Act 3 by himself, and the Dark Wanderer ended up going anyway. So now let's check this cinematic out. It is you told me, Tyriel. I found the temple of the Zakarum. In the deepest recesses of the temple, I found a dark gathering. My companion, the Wanderer, Talrasha, and a great evil who can only be the Lord of Hatred himself, Mephisto. I heard the voice then, like a thousand needles in my heart. My brothers, at long last we stand reunited. The infernal gate has been prepared, and the time of our final victory is at hand. Let the way to hell be opened. And the evil that was once vanquished shall rise anew. Wrapped in the guise of man 
shall he walk amongst the innocent, and terror shall consume they that dwell upon the earth. The skies shall rain fire, and the seas will become as blood. The righteous shall fall before the wicked, and all creation shall tremble before the burning standards of hell. What I saw then was not meant for mortal eyes. The gate stands ready. Time has come to assume your true form. So, what we just saw there was this tall Rasha Bale combination character looking guy, Diablo. The two of them got there, and Marius also got there himself. Again, this is the place in Act 3 where they get to uh, the Durance of Hate. This is where Mephisto is kind of being held captive that they just now broke out. So, at this point, all three primevils are out, two lesser evils are dead. We get to Act 3. And it's our job to kill Mephisto, right? Mephisto they leave behind, um, and Diablo and Bale go through the portal to hell. Actually, Bale doesn't, sorry. Bale kind of goes somewhere else, and we're going to see the cinematic for that afterward. There's about three more cinematics left. So, Mephisto's job is to guard that portal to the Pandemonium Fortress. Pandemonium Fortress is like the gateway to hell. Shaking my webcam. Pandemonium Fortress is the gateway to hell. Mephisto's job is to guard that and make sure we, the player characters, don't get there. Otherwise, I'll, you know, they'll, they'll be banned forever again, right? They were exiled. And Mephisto looked at Diablo and says, You are the harbinger of all return. Basically, they want to go back to hell. And they want to have that portal open so they can always come back whenever the hell they want. So Mephisto's job is to guard the portal. We, the player characters, go there and we kill them. Uh, along the way, we also kill the council. And just this this council of, of people, it's a Zacharum council. Mephisto basically make, made them went mad, and they turned into these crazy, like, Templar-type characters, and we kill them. And then we get, we make our way down to the Durance, and then we kill Mephisto. We take Mephisto's soul stone with us, and we're supposed to uh, take it to the Hellforge and shatter it. So that's that. That leads us up into Act 4. Here we have Terror's End. Let's take a look at this. I heard later that he was defeated. And that the Soul Stone was destroyed in Hellforge. All except one. <laughs> failed, dear Hill. I couldn't do as you asked. 
I couldn't enter that gate. Forgive me, Tyrion. Forgive me. Marius, give me the stone and all is forgiven. Give it to me, Marius. Take it. Take it, take it. I'm glad this is finally over, Terry. Oh, look what the stone has done to me. Oh. <laughs> You haven't failed, old man. You've done exactly as you were meant to do. However, I am not the Archangel Tyriel. Well, no, 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 no. <laughs> you have done well. Now I think you shall have your reward. Wow, okay. So a lot just happened in that cinematic. A lot just happened. We find out that Diablo now is now dead. His soul stone and Mephisto's soul stone were crushed, uh, or destroyed basically at the Hellforge. What does that mean? That means that supposedly, or essentially, Diablo and Mephisto cannot come back. They should be permanently dead, well, or trapped in this black abyss. And, and their soul stones were crushed, so they should not be able to enter Sanctuary again. That's basically what that means. Diablo's dead, Mephisto's dead, we also kill the Andariel and Diriel. So that's four of the, of the total seven. So now we have Bale, Asmodon, and Belial still left alive. What else do we find out? Marius was just killed by, again, like I said, this he appeared to be Tyriel. He was actually Bale. So Marius was hanging on to this, the third soul stone all this time, Bale's soul stone. He gives it back to what he believes to be Tyriel, who is actually Bale. So Marius gets killed by Bale. Bale takes off with his own soul stone, knowing that, well, now I cannot be killed. I should be fine. He goes to Mount Ariat to take over. And that is where we kind of lead into the Lord of Destruction. We've got two more cinematics left. Probably about another ten minutes. I know this, this is, episode is, is running pretty long. So yeah, um, we've got the search for Bales going on right now. And this leads us up into Act 5 of Diablo 2.
Bail! The gates of Sacheron have stood for eons beyond remembrance. And you shall not breach them now. Remove your foul demons from our lands. We stand on the side of light. And you shall not be allowed to reach Mount Ariat. And that which you seek will not be yours. Enough! Enough! I shall take your position into consideration. Terms are not acceptable. <laughs> So that is where we end up in Act Five. That that's the beginning of Act Five. Um, where we as the player character now travel to Mount Ariat and we see the very first quest is to go out there and, and we just see like right out as soon as we exit the gate all kinds of monsters are just hanging around tr killing, fighting, and barbarians that are trying to protect it basically it's our job to help protect it what you saw was the king gave him gave himself obviously just like, I thought it was kind of funny like Bale's like this weird voodoo kind of witch doctory type character and just kind of cool and he kind of just, you know, blah, and then boom, and then the uh, king just explodes. <laughs> um, so basically what we have is Bale and his minions storming the gates of Mount Ariat, or, or sorry, Harrogath, the city at Mount Ariat. Uh, we have this character called Nilathok who makes this deal with Bale. Bale basically tells him, look, if you don't make this deal with me, then I'm just going to kill everybody. And he believes him and gives him this relic that allows him access to Mount Ariat. So he gets right through Mount Area, goes to the dis um, destruction. Oh my God, I can't remember it. Just I oh, wow, that's embarrassing. But anyway, he goes to this place, this place in Mount Area, and he kind of takes over. His minions are doing whatever; they're kind of helping safeguard himself, and he goes to the World Stone. Now he takes the Soul Stone and he in infuses it with the World Stone, which actually I believe we're about to see in this next cinematic. So I'm going to show this one off. This one's only two minutes long. This is the last one I'm going to talk about, you know, and wrap up Diablo 2, talk a little bit about what happens between Diablo 2 and Diablo 3, and then we will get on with it. All right, here is the last.
so basically what we just saw was Tyrael going to the Worldstone. Worldstone Keep. That's what it's called. The Worldstone Keep, obviously, because it's where the Worldstone is. Goes to the Worldstone Keep, and he finds that Bale has infused his Soul Stone with the Worldstone. And what this does is it, it, it corrupts the Worldstone. And because the Worldstone itself is corrupted, it it's supposed to be like the all of... It's supposed to be what, what gives the Nephilim that power. And again, we're descendants of Nephilim. So the Worldstone becomes corrupt, and it what it what it will what will happen is all of the Nephilim and all the humans on Sanctuary are going to become irrevocably um, evil and corrupted, and they don't want that. So Tyrael's only choice is to destroy the World Stone. Now the World Stone is what keeps uh, the demons from just running onto Sanctuary. It, World Stone basically hides Sanctuary, so the demons and the angels can't really just come. Somehow these three primevals made it, and somehow Tyrael made it down. At some point in time, they also signed this treaty. Now, this treaty basically said that... Actually, I think it was right after the Sin War. They decided, the angels and the demons decided, well, we're not going to... We're going to let the Nephilim and the humans basically take care of themselves. We're not going to get involved with them. And that was that. So that way, neither side could use them to their advantage, except... Now, the World Stone is gone, so anybody can pretty much just freely pass through into Sanctuary from wherever they want. Which is kind of a problem, because Heaven, on the one hand they think the demons might use them, and the demons are like, well, we're going to use them at some point in time, so that's basically the deal. So at this point, the World Stone's corrupted. We saw Tyrael chuck his, his sword, the Eldarine, the Sword of Justice, into the World Stone to destroy it. His sword goes flying and lands literally in the hands of this kid called Jacob, and that's actually where these comics come into play. Um, actually, I think the comic is called The Sword of Justice, I haven't gotten a chance to read it. I just got my a, a couple copies from Blizzard that I'm going to be able to give away. I'm also going to be able to give away Book of Cain. I think what I'm going to do is hang on to these um, for the launch party that I'll be doing with, with Marcus, or DJ Wheat, sorry. Um, so yeah, we're going to give away some cool stuff. Anyway, lore stuff. Lore stuff. So, World Stone is now destroyed. Anybody basically has free passage into Sanctuary. Heaven is kind of scared about this. The demons really want to take advantage of it. Five of the seven prime e or evils are dead. Diablo, Mephisto, and Bale are all dead. Um, their soul stones are gone because remember, uh, Bale's soul stone was infused with the world stone, so now it, it was it was killed and broken, shattered. Um, and Dariel and Duriel, we also killed in Acts one and two. So five of the seven are dead. Meanwhile, Asmodon and Belial are in hell, kind of you know taking over themselves. It's just the two of them; they don't have to worry about whatever. So the two of them are just they're the kings of hell. And they're loving it. And now they find out that all of their brothers and sisters are dead. So now they can yeah, take over Sanctuary. And that's kind of where Diablo 3 leaves off. This giant meteor crashes into the Tristram Cathedral. And crazy stuff starts happening. Deckard Cain prophesizes that this is the end of days. And crazy stuff, like I said, is going to start happening. All these bodies of, of, of dead minions and, and monsters that we've killed in the previous two games start resurrecting and ri reviving from the dead. Uh, we have King Leoric, who we fight in the beta. We have Lockdonin. We see his soul uh, go and slay L Leoric's like soul. It's kind of just like a mini cinematic type thing in the in the beta, which is really cool. We get to see all these journals from all these characters. We all these monsters that, like I said, all these monsters we've killed revive. So now we have to fight some of these same monsters, like like Fallen and Quill Beasts, Quill Rats, whatever. We're now fighting all these characters, and at the same time, Zoltan Cool, who we've also killed, somehow comes back to life. Well, obviously because of this meteor. So at some point in the game, I'm not exactly sure when, Blizzard kind of just showed it off at one of the BlizzCons. They didn't really give us too much information about it, obviously because it's a huge spoiler. Um, so we know Zoltan Cool com somehow comes in. We also know Diablo comes back to life. I'm just going to talk a little bit about that. Zoltan Cool, remember I said he was this he was this Madden Haradrim sorcerer back in the day when they they went for the hunt for the three. Uh, Zoltan Cool was was this, this sketchy guy. He decided that he was going to take it upon himself and create his own soul stone. Now the first three soul stones were created from the world stone. He somehow figures out how to make his own soul stone, which is called the Black Soul Stone, and it's man-made. It's the only one man-made one, which is kind of crazy. So Asmodon and Belial find out about this, and they decide, holy crap, we need to get our hands on that. That's the key to everything. If one of us has that, we will be able to run the show. Everything. So somehow Diablo comes back to life, and I'd be willing to bet that it has to do with the Black Soul Stone. 
Uh, Diablo is the only boss that comes back to life. So in Diablo 3, we've got um, Asmodon, Belial, and Diablo, who we fight, the three of them. Now, I mean, I don't want to give away like too many spoilers, so I think I will just leave it at that. Um, basically, after in between Diablo 1 and 2, we have this comic, the uh, Sword of Justice, where this Jacob kid gets the Eldarine, Sword of Justice, obviously. He does some crazy stuff. Like I said, I haven't had a chance to read it. All I know is it happens in between, and he gets the sword and uses it for justice, and he kills some crazy guy that has been uh, like trying to bring him down, and he wants that sword, and, and that's kind of the gist of it from what I understand. Tyrael, I believe, meets with just Jacob Kid, gets the sword back, and 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 that's kind of where we leave off with, at Diablo 3 with what I was just telling you guys. So... I don't want to go into too much without spoiling stuff because I do know some stuff because people have data mine stuff and leaked it on the internet. So, I mean, if you want to, you can probably just look it up on Google and find out. Um, but I want to say that, well, there's also going to be two expansions for Diablo 3. I want to say that we travel probably to both heaven and hell throughout the game because there is this city called Yura that we will be visiting. And Yura is, is like the Pandemonium Fortress. The Pandemonium Fortress, again, is the gateway to hell. Yura is the gateway to heaven. And we travel to Europe in one of the expansions. I, that's about all I know. So I want to say that we're probably well, we're obviously going to have to kill Asmodon, Belial, and, and Diablo. And at some point we're going to travel to heaven. Some point we're going to travel to hell. And you know this is all Diablo three. So I mean I'm I'm kind of just using based what I kind of know about the data mine stuff without spoiling anything and using my own theories. My personal theory is that Leia, um, Dia or Kane's adopted daughter, a.k.a. his niece. My theory is that she becomes corrupted and Diablo takes control of her because, again, she was born while Aiden and Adria, or while Aiden was corrupted by Diablo himself, and, you know, him and Adria have this baby Leia. He gets out of there, and I'm going to say that Leia was, or, or becomes corrupted by Diablo, which is another part of how Diablo comes back. Just my personal theory, I mean, there's really nothing of substance other than the fact that Aiden was corrupted and Diablo comes back and just kind of makes sense. And actually, Diablo really looks like a female in this third game. So I'm just tossing that out there, some food for thought. You guys can, you know, make your own judgments. Again, if you're really interested in this stuff, I highly recommend reading those the books that I listed here. Let me pull that up again, actually. Um, here we go. Pull this up. Here we go. These books, the Sinwar Archive, the Diablo Archive, and Moon of the Spider. And then we also have this third book, The Order, dropping on May 15th. Uh, which is it's a Diablo 3 specific book. I also recommend the Book of Cain. Like I said, I'm going to be giving away this Book of Cain, and I've got some some of the Sword of Justice comics, the first three. There's five total. I'm going to give them away at the launch party with DJ Wheat. That should be a lot of good fun. Um, I was going to do like Q&A, community question type things with the chat, just because I really wanted to work that in. It was actually kind of some feedback I got, and I, and I agreed with it. I thought that was a really cool idea. Um, maybe not today, because today was pretty much just me talking about lore. So I'm just going to cut it off here. Um, if you guys have any questions for me, think about them. We're gonna, I'm going to start that off, pick that up with, with this next episode. And actually, let me double check. I think my next episode is just going to be all about the environment. Yes, my next episode is Wednesday, th 3 p.m. PST, unless I tell you guys otherwise, but assume it's 3 p.m. PST, which is 6 Eastern. So Wednesday's episode is going to be environment and the dungeons that we're going to be encountering and probably some bestiary just because they're they've been the same across all three games. And that should do it for today's episode, guys. I know I ran a little bit long, but lore is a huge part of Diablo, so I didn't really want to cut off anything. All right, guys. Uh, take it easy. I'm just going to play some music while we get out of here. So take it easy, guys. Actually, one more thing, sorry. Don't forget about beta keys. Follow me on Twitter at Sixon and tweet hashtag Diablo Daily. I'm going to be giving them away today and tomorrow. I know I kind of already cut it, but okay, we're good now. Back to the music, and I'm going to run a commercial or two. All right, see you guys.